I would invite you to turn in the Word of God tonight to John chapter 11, the Gospel of John and the 11th chapter. It's been some weeks since we were last here. Um, perhaps uh, you've maybe forgotten some of the things that we dealt with, but it is a familiar chapter, so no doubt uh, the scene it doesn't require too much of a overview. You're well aware that it brings to our mind the great uh, deliverance of the Lord in the experience of Lazarus, who was dead, and the Lord causes him to rise to life again. And we've been making our way uh, through this scene, uh, has had some tremendous lessons for us, actually, certainly in the opening part, when we see uh, the language of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he talks about uh, this uh, sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby, there in verse 4. So, uh, back there, uh, there was a tremendous lesson, great truths for us to learn, uh, and truths today that aren't understood by many in the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, sadly, there is great uh, misunderstanding about sickness and death and all sorts of skewed ideas. But I don't want to go over all that. If you did miss those, you can go back and listen to them online. We're coming to the real heart of the event now in Christ applying himself to deliver Lazarus. We will take up the reading, I think, from... I'm going to give some overview by our reading, perhaps. Uh, we'll read back from... We'll take time to read, actually, from uh, verse 18. We'll just go over this. It's been a long time, so we'll go back to verse 18, and we'll read down through verse 44, just to refresh your minds. John 11, verse 18. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. It's about uh, two miles or so. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Amen. Ending our reading at the end of verse 44. And let us now take these moments just again to pray for the blessing of the Lord upon our meditation in his word. Let's pray. Our God, we thank thee for the word of the living God. And we confess to thee there are some portions that enrich us and bless us more than others. Our comprehension of them or the things that they deal with and how they help us to face the, the problems and trials of life. And when we come to John 11, we confess again that it's too lofty for us. There's much here that we cannot fully fathom. And yet, Lord, this is to be understood by us to the degree that it ought to bless us and help us. Make thy word to be a blessing to thy people tonight. And grant, O God, if there be any outside of Christ, that they may be alarmed by what they do not yet possess. I pray, O God, that thou wilt take the word and make it sharp, that it might divide into the heart. Thou wilt take thy truth and use it to build up the people of God in their most holy faith, and to bind the strong man and spoil his goods, and do good unto Zion tonight in this house. Come, fill us with the Holy Ghost. Give us ears to hear. Give us a heart to understand. And grant, O God, that great glory will be brought to the name of Jesus Christ. Help me now, Lord. Fill me, please. I cry to thee. We cannot do this of ourselves. It will be dead unless the Lord takes it and makes it live. So make it live, Lord, here tonight in all of our lives. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle John began this great gospel in the fourth verse of the first chapter by saying that in him, that is, in Christ, was life. He introduces us to the idea of life having its origination in the Lord Jesus himself, right at the beginning of the gospel. And as I said to you way back a year and a half ago or so, when we began looking at this gospel, and when we started looking at the opening 18 verses known as the prologue, I said that in those opening 18 verses of the first chapter are certain themes and truths about Christ that are developed through the book. It's not just an introduction for the sake of an introduction. It's introducing us to the truths and the themes that will be borne out in the events and details that John is going to draw our minds to see. Here in John chapter 11, we're being given evidence to the fact that life finds its source in the Son of God. Remember back in verse 25 of John 11, we read it there when Jesus made that well-known statement to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am life. It's not that I have life. That's true. It's not that I give life. That's true. But I am life. Life exists because I first existed. That because of my existence, there is life. There would be no life if there was no Christ. But why does Jesus perform this miracle upon Lazarus here? Again, you can see the, 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 some of the, the confusion that comes upon even those in the scene. Uh, how there is this desire even from Mary and Martha. You know, if the Lord comes and visits in the sickness, then Lazarus need not die. And those who watch on, we read of that as well. As they look at this in verse 37, when they, they think of themselves that, well, has he not just opened the eyes of the blind in John chapter 9? That event became very well known in Jerusalem. And here some of them understand that and they realize what he did there. And they say, having opened the eyes of the blind, could he not have caused that even this man should not have died? There's confusion. Why didn't Jesus Christ come in order to deliver Lazarus from the oncoming threat of death? Why not heal him before he dies? Well, the Lord Jesus performs this miracle, first of all, to strengthen the faith of his followers by a revelation of God's glory. You'll see that brought out in his language in verse 4 of the chapter. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so we, we find out here that the Lord has a love for this family, and it tells us then that it's for the glory of God 
then we see Christ responding in a way that reflects the expression of, of, of how he wants certain events to take place that will glorify God. Because in verse 6 it goes on and says, When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He doesn't go to Lazarus, he stays where he is, signifying his desire that Lazarus should die. That by his death, something is going to bring glory to God and be a means of strengthening the faith of his people. It's also performed to indicate his future resurrection and the resurrection of all believers. As Jesus Christ stands before this grave, this cave, with a man dead therein, and these events unfold where he is raised to life again after having been dead for four days, we are seeing the power of the Lord Jesus Christ over death. It reflects the fact that when he dies, if his people would only recall to mind the events of this case here in John 11, when Jesus dies, that doesn't mean that it's the end. Now that's what came upon the hearts of his disciples. They became fearful and frightened by the death of Christ on the cross. But if they kept in mind the events of John 11, they might have had their faith strengthened to see <laughs> that with Jesus Christ, anything is possible. He has authority over death. And they ought to have been encouraged to see that. But also for the resurrection of believers. As signified by Jesus Christ when he is dealing with Martha earlier on in the scene, when he speaks to her, uh, and Martha says in verse 24, I know that he, that's Lazarus, shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Good, very orthodox of you, Martha. That's true. Lazarus will rise at the last day, the great final resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Though it appears that he is under the captivity of death, he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, never die at all. So there's a sense in which we realize if we trust in Jesus Christ, we never die. And it gives us hope for our future as well as those who trust in his name. But thirdly, the miracle is performed by Christ upon Lazarus to prove that he is who he says he is in verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm going to prove it. And he did this in certain of his signs that, he, that, that John focuses upon in this gospel, that he would perform a miracle and then say things about himself that relate to that, or he will say things about himself and then perform the miracle that prove the point. And we find it in the feeding of the 5,000. He feeds them and then he calls himself the bread of God. He is the one sent down from heaven. That is, he, he is the one who gives life to all before him. All the multitudes in all of their need, Christ is the answer. And the feeding of the 5,000 just reflected that. That miracle showed that what Jesus said about himself was indeed true. What we find here again in this miracle, as we have in many of the miracles, if not all of them, we have the, the creative power of the Lord Jesus that he makes, creates out of nothing. That what John said about him in the very beginning of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Everything's made by him is then proved by the miracles. So we can turn water into wine. That's his creative power. Uh, making wine to be there when there was nothing but water. That's creative power. To give sight to the blind, to create bread and, and fish and multiply it when it doesn't exist. Uh, and here as well, when there's a man dead, he brings to life again, we see his creative power. This is the same being that brought life into existence. This is the one sovereignly conducting his power in Genesis chapter 1. It is the same person. When we come to John 11, very often the raising of Lazarus is used as a symbol of the new birth, a picture of what happens when one comes to Christ, their experience of being saved. And what we're singing about, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. The experience of life, the experience of salvation. And yet, this isn't really what it's dealing with. I, I don't believe that there's anything wrong with applying it that way. Uh, any, any sense of, of life from the dead 
clearly reflects salvation. We can clearly apply it in that regard. But here, this passage is focusing upon a future resurrection. That is really what is in view in this portion. It is closely associated with the physical, literal resurrection promised to believers who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, a preview, if you will, of what is to come in our future if we are Christians here tonight. We're considering then verses 38 through 44, picking up from where we left off some weeks ago and dealing with this scene, verses 38 through 44, Christ's destruction of death. Christ's destruction of death. Well, firstly with me, Christ approaches death as an enemy. Look at verses 38 and 39. I'm not going to go over the past. If you want to see the whole scene, then please go back and listen. But let's just get on with what this passage here is dealing with. Verse 38, Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. It tells us in the verse 38 that he came again groaning. Look at those words, again groaning in himself. This is the same as was mentioned in verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit. He groaned in the spirit. And so that's why it uses the, the word again. He is groaning again. The same expression used, the same feeling reflected in verse 33 is felt again by Jesus Christ in verse 38. Now, the idea here of groaning isn't how we might use the term groaning, that we might groan on Monday morning when we have work, although not tomorrow, most people are off tomorrow for Thanksgiving, but when we have to face a day that we are too tired to face, and we might groan. Or if someone does something that causes us to sigh, there's kind of a groaning sigh. There's those. But this isn't what this word means at all. When we dealt with this the last time, I made mention to you the meaning of this term. And I'll go over that again just so we get it because it's coming up here again in verse 38. It has the idea either of a stern command or indignation. There is anger, if we might use that term, felt within the Lord Jesus Christ. His groaning is a groaning of indignation and anger. Just to clarify this scene, uh, as we did last time, and, and why Jesus is feeling this way, because that's a legitimate question. Why would Jesus be feeling indignation at a funeral? Why? Why would he be feeling indignation at the scene of mourning following the death of someone? Why would he feel this way? Why? Well, last time we pointed to Warfield, and we couldn't really do any uh, better than that, as far as I'm concerned, in clarifying this feeling and why the Lord felt this way. Warfield, of course, as I said last time, was known as the last of the Princeton theologians. He was a tremendous mind and theologian. And he wrote an essay called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. You can get it online, read it for yourself. The Emotional Life of Our Lord. And in it, he writes of this passage, quote, what John tells us in point of fact is that Jesus approached the grave of Lazarus in a state not of uncontrollable grief, but of irrepressible anger. And again, we ask why. Why is there irrepressible anger? We normally come to a death scene with grief and sorrow. Jesus is coming with anger. Now, there's sorrow there as well. We dealt with that, the fact that he wept in verse 35. But here there's anger. Anger. That's what verse 38 is saying. Again, he is angry. He is indignant here as he faces this death scene. But why? Some think it's because of the insincerity of the mourners. The fact that they are standing around and they're kind of just going through the motion and they don't truly grieve over the death of Lazarus. But John doesn't differentiate. If you look at verse 33 where it says, uh, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, these mourners. It's not that the Lord is annoyed with them, groaned in the spirit. He's annoyed with their kind of hypocrisy in it all. Because the same word is used in verse 38. It's nothing to do with them. He makes no distinction between the weeping of the mourners and the weeping of Mary. So what is it? Well, again, Warfield goes on to say, The spectacle of the distress of Mary and her companions enraged Jesus because it brought poignantly home to his consciousness the evil of death. 
He goes on and says, It is death that is the object of his wrath. And behind death, him who has the power of death and whom he has come into the world to destroy. He then says, what John does for us in this particular statement is to uncover to us the heart of Jesus as he wins for us our salvation, not in cold unconcern, but in flaming wrath against the foe. Jesus smites in our behalf. He has not only saved us from the evils which oppress us, He is felt for and with us in our oppression. And under the impulse of these feelings, he has wrought out our redemption. End quote. Christ is indignant because he sees the evil of death and the one behind it, even Satan himself. And so Christ approaches this death scene as he would approach an enemy. With the feelings that you might feel toward an enemy in the battlefield where it's do or die, it's you or me. And he comes into the scene ready to wage war against this great enemy we know as death. He is enraged at it, and he faces it with the spirit of one in battle. And death, my friends, is an enemy. The Word of God makes that plain. We are told in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The implication is that it's one of many, one of many enemies, along with the devil, along with many other things. But death itself is an enemy in this world. It was not created by God. It was not part of the first world. It is something that came through the fall, and it is an enemy, an enemy. Christ knows it's an enemy and faces it as such. In fact, turn to 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, just to look here for a moment at what the Apostle Paul teaches us in this respect. Uh, death is an enemy. It is trying to hold its, uh, exercise its power over you and over me. And it also very successfully without the aid and, and victory of the cross of Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll take time to read uh, from verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23, it tells us, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. What's he saying here? Christ is the first resurrection, and then after there will be those who will rise at his coming. Verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. He is reigning now. He is reigning over his enemies. He is putting them under his feet. And the last one, look at it, verse 26, is death. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Here we see the reign of Jesus Christ. He is the first to rise from the dead. He is the first fruits in that regard. And you say, well, well how is he the first fruit? Well, Christ is the first fruits. That is, he is the first to rise from the dead in such a way that death has no more power over the body. Others rose from the dead. In the Old Testament, we have people rising from the dead. In the New Testament, not just Lazarus, but we have two other examples in the ministry of Christ that rose from the dead. We have some in the apostolic era as well. So we have people rising from the dead, but they would die again. They would die again. Christ is the first fruits. He is the first to rise in such a fashion that death has no more power over the body. And that will be something we will enter into at the last day. We will be delivered from its grip, and there will be a harvest of those brought out of the graves with our bodies redeemed. The devil, you see, brought death and despair to man. Lord Jesus told us in John chapter 8 and verse 44 that he was a murderer from the beginning. Now remember, in the the context of death, uh, we can talk about the death of many things, but not all deaths are murder. Murder is something exclusively applied within the realm of humanity. You can't murder an animal. It's not created in the image of God. That's what makes murder murder. It is the attack upon the image of God and man. And Murder, therefore, is something that is exclusive within the realm of the human race. So when Jesus says that the devil was a murderer from the beginning, 
He is telling us that he was the first to initiate and drive home. He was really the, 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 the mastermind behind death. He ushered it in. He led man into it. He was the murderer. He brought death into humanity. That was his doing, his influence. And here in John 11, we have Christ facing death. He is confronting death. He is dealing with death. And he is dealing with it as an enemy. If death is an enemy, then it's not something we pander to. It's not something we talk and say niceties about and, and talk pleasantries about. It is an enemy. An enemy of Christ. And Jesus Christ does not take lightly to his enemies. So he comes indignant, verse 38. He again groaned in himself, cometh to the grave. He comes with this indignation, this anger. He is going to deal with death. The Lord is using the resurrection of Lazarus to show his power over death. And he does have power over death. He does. Thank God. You see, the devil uses death as an instrument to torture us. He does. He initiated it and he has applied it and used it to bring great fear into the hearts of men. This is what is dealt with in Hebrews chapter 2. If you go forward in your New Testament to Hebrews chapter 2, um, verses 14 through 15, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, speaking about Christ, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, Christ, likewise took, took part of the same. He took our humanity, right? He became man. He was God. God cannot die, but he becomes man. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the devil, as the initiator of death, as the one who brought death into humanity, was the one who tempted, the one who deceived, the one who led astray Adam and Eve and brought this experience into their life. He is using it, constantly using it, as something of a power, an influence that he can uh, wield to, look what it says, bring the fear of death, keeping them in bondage. Men live in bondage to death. Do you not see it? Have you not felt it in your own heart, a sense of a fear of death? Well, if you've been a believer for a long time, perhaps you've overcome it. Faith has rose up in your heart. It's no longer a problem to you. And praise the Lord for that. But death is not something that is imaginary. It is real. And the vast majority of men will be honest in their sense of fear and unwillingness to face death. And the devil uses it to keep men in bondage, a bondage of fear, fear slavish fear in this life. And Christ came to break them free of that. Death holds its sway over us. Lazarus could not deliver himself. <laughs> He's dead. Death is holding its power over his body. And what Christ is showing is, I'm going to crush that enemy once and for all. And so that's what happens. He comes in this indignant frame of mind and his indignant spirit, and he faces this cave, verse 38. That was very common. They would bury in caves, that they would place them in caves. And a stone lay upon it. For obvious reasons, they would put a stone in front of the cave. It would keep wild animals out from eating the corpses. It would keep the stench from getting out as well. Uh, and so on and so forth. Many uh, obvious reasons why they would put a stone. So that deals with then Christ approaches death as an enemy. Secondly, Christ announces to Martha his victory. He approaches death as an enemy, but he announces to Martha his victory. Look at verse 40. We'll read from verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Mar Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Not much really to say there. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? So Martha responds to the Lord in the sense of, well, what's the point in this? He's been dead four days. I told you to come when he was yet alive. What is the point in going to him now? He's been dead four days. He is going to be rotten. The stench is going to be unbearable. But he says, 
said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Interesting. This essentially is a gentle rebuke. Christ was not averse to giving rebukes, even to his people and his followers. And he had told her that Lazarus would live, did he not? Didn't we read about it? Did he not say in verse 23, thy brother shall rise again? <laughs> now, she believed that, but she believed that in a certain context, the final resurrection. But Jesus is going to show his power over death and the fact that that final resurrection will definitely take place by raising Lazarus. No. That's what he said. That's what he meant when he said this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God. It's going to bring glory. Therefore, the death of Lazarus is going to be different than other deaths. The death of Lazarus is going to be set apart from other deaths. Something about the death of Lazarus is going to bring great glory. And if Martha had been paying attention, we don't know if that news of what Jesus said in verse 4 got to her ears, if it was carried by those who came to seek him out, whether that was brought back to them or not, we don't know. But he did tell her, thy brother shall rise again, and gives her certain truths about what happens when you believe in him. And though he were dead, yet shall he live. Again, he's teaching something here. He is helping her to see and she ought to be anticipating that this truth that he's teaching now, he is teaching for a reason. In the context of my brother's death, why is Jesus continually talking about life and raising the dead and so on? Why? Is he going to do something here? And of course he was, but she didn't see it. You're going to see the glory of God. That is, you're going to see a very evident revelation of God. Israel had known little in recent days of the glory of God. In fact, the whole glory of God that, that dwelt in the temple went up at the time of the captivity. We read about that in Ezekiel 8 and 9. You see the glory of God uh, disappearing, as it were, uh, going away from the temple. And we never read about it, by the way, even whenever they come back from captivity and they rebuild the temple and so on, we never read of the glory of God coming down into the temple again. We don't read about that. You don't see any sign of that. And that's not to say that God wasn't with his people, but that's just a fact. Before the captivity, we see the glory of God departing. And in a real sense, it never truly came back until Jesus Christ came. That's what it tells us. It tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was full and that he was the one, uh, not only full of grace and truth, but verse 14 of John 1, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father. We beheld the glory of the Son of God. We had God manifested amongst us. That's why they gave them the, him the name Emmanuel, God with us. So they're going to see something here, the glory of God. They're going to see Christ working in such a way that will reveal the glory of God in a very evident way. So he announces to Martha his victory. Martha needed to be paying attention, just like you and me. And you know, it may come to the day, and just make this application, or it may come the day where you are in a place where you're facing the end. Where I'm having to come by your bedside, that's if God spares you to have such an experience which is not guaranteed but you're lying there, sick, facing death in the face, maybe months or days away from death, and I'm coming to you, and I'm coming with the Word of God. I am praying with you and ministering to you, and it's there, my friend, it's there, beloved, that all that has proceeded must, must be well-founded and well-grounded in your heart to go through the experience of facing death in unrest and torment is not the lot of believers. And they're not to be like Martha. We are not to be like her where we don't understand what the Lord is doing and wondering and questioning him and saying, well, he stinks. What would be the point in that? Why would we roll away the stone? Now, there may be elements of your experience that you will never understand. Uh, what he does now, thou shalt not know until hereafter, you'll not be aware fully of what the Lord is doing in every detail. But you will know this, 
the comfort of the Holy Ghost, your peace in believing, a sense of His presence, and a trust in His Word. I want to minister to you so that having seen you live well, you will die well. We ought to have that in our hearts, a desire, even a frequent prayer. Lord, let me die well. Let me die well. And people are watching on. Medical staff, family and friends, let them see our Christianity really reveal itself to them. Our absolute trust, complete peace, our rest, and not merely because of the sedation of medical in intervention, but before that ever comes along, before we're sedated and out of our minds and incapable of being anything but placid, but in real conscious faith, resting in Christ, when we know that the curtains are drawing in our time. Christ has gotten a victory, and we should enter into the joy and release of it. Thirdly, Christ appeals to the Father as a testimony. He approaches death as an enemy, announces to Martha his victory, and appeals to the Father as a testimony. Verses 41 through 42. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. There's no request here. Note that. He's not praying for something. You see that? He's not asking for anything. He's not asking for the Father to raise up Lazarus. That's, that's all past. That's all already settled. <laughs> But he is praying audibly as a testimony for the benefit of the observer. He is giving evidence, I think here, now follow me, he is giving evidence here to what was repeatedly denied elsewhere. Back in John chapter 10, in verse 30, Jesus declared, I and my Father are one. In verses 32 through 33, it tells us then, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? They're about to stone him. Why do you stone me? What, what, what work are you wanting to stone me for? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So that's the reason for stoning him. Blasphemy. Verse 37 Jesus says, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. That you may understand what I said in verse 30, I and my Father in one, that statement that you want to murder me for. But if you pay attention and see the works and then understand believing the works, that will lead you to realize that the Father is in me and I in Him. Look at the works. Now, when we come to John 11, we have a tremendous work. And Jesus Christ is not going to allow them the opportunity to say that some conspiracy is going on. He stands before the grave. He prays audibly to His Father as a testimony to all around that what's about to take place is foreordained and is according to his will. He is praying. He has already prayed that Lazarus will rise from the dead to the glory of God. And so he prays audibly. He appeals to the Father in prayer as a testimony to all. They are not going to be able to disconnect this. That's the point. He's saying something here. And a few minutes later, a man dead for four days is going to walk out. They need to make the connection. They need to see that indeed Jesus Christ is God, manifest in flesh. It tells us that he cried with a loud voice in verse 43. When he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. This was no silent call. This was no quiet speech. This was a great cry. It has the idea of shouting with a great voice, as loudly as he was capable. And he calls Lazarus out of the cave. Indeed, what's interesting, when I looked at the word in the Greek, he cried with a loud voice. 
Now, the word is used elsewhere in the New Testament, not that often, but it is used, him crying, this, this loud cry of Jesus with a loud voice. But it's used in John 18, verse 40, in the cry of the crowd for Barabbas. And it's used in John 19, verses 6 and verse 15, in the call for Christ's crucifixion, the same cry. The same energetic, that, that kind of cry that exerts the entire being of the individual. Here we find Christ exercising this cry to bring life to sinners. And later on, we're going to find the same energy, the same desire used by men to call for the death of the Savior. What a horrendous world we live in. What mercy Christ shows to men. This was a display here for the people, designed for them to connect his words with his will and see the outcome in the raising of Lazarus. This man wills the resurrection of this man. And that happens. <laughs> right at the same moment. And he cries because there's a great crowd gathered here. There are many, many people gathered around at this time. They have followed Mary out to the grave. There are many mourners gathering there. And Jesus is standing there. Again, another testimony to them. Listen, I want you not to... You know, Jesus could have whispered, but in his mercy, he's shouting in mercy so that people hear. It's part of the reason I raise my voice too. Because if I speak in monotone, you might not hear everything I say. You'll shut off. You'll fall asleep. But there is that necessity at times to draw your attention to truth, to raise the voice, to passionately plea, to call you to listen. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Lazarus, come forth. A tremendous shout. He comes forth then. Verse 44. <laughs> tells us that he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. You say, well, how did he come forth? There's a couple of different ideas about what happened here. If, if he is bound hand and foot in the grave clothes and he's wrapped with these grave clothes, how could he move? <laughs> how could he get up and move? And some have suggested that part of the miracle was Christ actually in that call, not only giving life to a dead corpse, but also pulling him out of the cave and setting him in front of the people. But also, it may be simply that in the binding of the body, that each leg was bound individually and not together, so there was still a sense in which there may be some movement in the individual having life entered into them. I don't know, but the point is this. He comes forth. He comes forth. He stands there in the mouth of the cave, and Jesus says, loose him and let him go. So imagine, imagine being the person kind of going up to this man you know has been dead for four days. I'm walking up to him. Who should go? Should Martha go? Should Mary go? Should someone else go? Who should go? And then just peeling back all the, all the, the garment all the, or all the, the material that had been wound around. Imagine, imagine, imagine hearing his breath and the heartbeat and the amazement of the scene. What a thing indeed. That brings us forth to them finally. Christ addresses the dead in certainty. He addresses the dead in certainty. It's an amazing scene here. It is. He, he comes, and as we've looked here, he cries with a loud voice, and Lazarus comes forth, and he's bound, and so on. Now, we saw in verse 39 that the curse had set in. The curse had set He'd been dead for four days. That's the curse. Death has come in to Lazarus the same way it would come in to any person. But we have here an insight, as I said to you at the start, an insight into what is ahead for the Lord's people. That we will die, our bodies will decompose, but they will not remain in that state forever. According to Romans 8, 23, Paul writes there, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. We're waiting for that. The redemption of of our body. That's believers. Those who are saved, they await. Those who are saved will await the redemption of the body. And just to make this point, this needs to be kept in mind when people are telling you that sickness and ill health are not to be the experience of the Christian here in this life. 
The redemption of the body is yet future, men and women. Any promise of perfect health that is promoted by far too many is a lie. It's not scriptural. The Lord Jesus Christ does not guarantee nor promise perfect health to those in this scene of time, saved or otherwise. And when you take verses like Isaiah 53, by his stripes you're healed, and you apply them in the physical realm when they had absolutely nothing to do with the physical. It's spiritual. It's salvation. And Peter proves it when he takes that text and expounds on it in his letter. It's to do with saving grace, the saving of the soul. Nothing to do with the body. That's twisting Scripture. It's twisting Scripture. We will suffer. Some of you do. Many of you will. You will suffer. And that's part of life. That's part of life. Whether it is, as someone said even just before the meeting, the pain of the back, that's suffering. That's the body breaking down. It's a world that's imperfect. And Paul writes that the whole of creation groans because of the curse that's still applied and experienced here and now. But we wait the redemption of our body. That is coming. That is coming. Paul writes also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You see the progress there, the progression of thought. Jesus Christ has made wisdom to us. That's where it begins, wisdom. Why does it begin there? Well, according to Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. Salvation is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> Anyone here who is saved has been made wise unto salvation, as Timothy said, or as Paul writes to Timothy. Wise unto salvation. The Word of God has made you wise to salvation. You have come in to salvation. And that begins with a fear of God, a true an understanding of the gospel. That's wisdom. Wisdom begins with, with salvation. But then it goes on to righteousness. That is, imputed righteousness, whereby we stand justified before God. Sanctification, the experience of the believer through his life, where he dies more and more unto sin, lives more and more unto righteousness, according to Romans chapter 6. And then after that, redemption. Now, sometimes we use redemption with regard to the salvation. And that's fine. The Bible does that too. There is a redemption where we talk about, I am redeemed, oh praise the Lord. We can talk about that, as the hymn writer put it. In the saving of my soul, in the day of my new birth, there was redemption. But there is a future redemption, as pointed out in these scriptures, Romans 8, 23, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And there is a day, my friend, when our bodies, though held for a time under the power of death, will be redeemed. They will. Why will they be redeemed? Because they belong to the Lord. <laughs> Our bodies belong to him. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Your body doesn't belong to you. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our bodies belong to God. Christ has purchased them upon the cross. And Paul also tells us that Jesus will, in Philippians 3.20, change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That is, the power of Jesus Christ, all power is given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. That includes the power to take your decomposed, corrupt body <laughs> that apparently doesn't even exist anymore years after your departure but he will take it because it is his. And on that great day, he will make it like unto his body. Fit it for glory. <laughs> this deliverance from death is why the believer, for the believer, there, there is no more death in their final experience. There is no death in heaven because Christ has removed it for the believer. It's dealt with. The last enemy is death. Jesus deals with death through his atoning work. There is no death. That's why heaven has no death. Heaven does not have no death simply because God is there. We are going there as those who are under the power of death. The only way heaven can have you and me 
without death is of Jesus Christ dealing with that enemy. And that's what he's done. That's why it says in Revelation 21 verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Then, at the full redemption of the body. Whereas what about the unbeliever? What about them? What about you perhaps, if you're not saved? Death doesn't go away for you, you see. Lazarus here is a picture of that deliverance. Jesus, even though one is under the power of death for a season, he will speak a word, and those that are in the graves, according to John 5, will come forth. He has destroyed death, and he will remove them from under its power on the day of final resurrection. But for those not in Christ, it is not so. They will not be removed from the presence of death. He has not conquered death for them. That is why, that is why, in the casting into the lake of fire, it is called, in Revelation 20, 14, the second death. The final judgment of men when Jesus Christ appoints to those who have disobeyed and rebelled against the gospel, the final judgment for them is a second death. They have went through the first death. They have been held under its power in the grave. Their bodies have not been redeemed. They are there decomposing under its power. And when their bodies are finally resurrected for that great day of judgment and are finally cast into the lake of fire, it is still death for them. And if you're not in Christ, it's death for you. A death is unimaginable. A death in which its suffering is incomprehensible. And perhaps we should just read those words of Revelation 20 to you before we end tonight. Just so you know what the Word of God reveals will occur on that great day. Revelation 20 verse 11. John is having a vision here of what is to come in the future. Verse 11 of Revelation 20. I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was not found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So there are books opened on this day of judgment. The plural term of the books refers to that which records your deeds, your actions, how you will be judged, what suffering you will endure, what level, what degree of hell you will go through. You say, are there degrees in hell? Yes, there are. Degrees of suffering. Jesus made it plain. <laughs> there were cities he went into in his ministry. Oh, listen, because this applies to you. He went into cities and he preached his truth and he had to depart with the words, with the reality, saying, it will be worse for them than Sodom. Why? Sodom had no Bible. Sodom didn't have all the truth of the incarnate Christ preaching to them. But these towns and cities had. And he says it will be worse. Their works will be weighed and found to be the worst. And so their suffering will be greater. So it is for you. 
If you're here tonight and you're outside of Christ, you're halting, you're hesitating, you're putting it off for whatever reason. You're holding on to some fraudulent testimony, some vain imagination of being right with God, but the root of the matter isn't there. I appeal to you in God's name, get out from under the judgment, flee from the wrath to come. Get yourself into Christ. Experience eternal life here and in the life to come and the promise of the redemption of your body. Christ has crushed death for all who trust in him. May the Lord help us, help us all, and especially if you're not saved, help you to see your need to flee and get the Christ to be saved this night. Let's bow together in prayer.